Well, good morning to all of you faithful Labor Day Church attenders. It is great to see you. And I also want to give a shout out to all of those, again, who are cadets and the parents of cadets. Now, parents, I want to let you know, your cadets really do come to church. I see them all the time, so you can go home knowing that that's the case. Well, it seems hard to believe that we've already reached the final independent weekend of this ministry year. And as I shared with you last time that this occurred, I really do try to pick a topic and a passage that fits where we are as a church community. And so as I thought through what to say today, I thought it would be very helpful for us to look at a biblical perspective of service. Now, let me explain why that is. First of all, I think it's the right time of year to do it. As you know, we're in sort of a launch format here during the time when kids are back to school and we're starting our school programs. And you've probably noticed that we've mentioned a number of great opportunities for you to serve. For example, Last part of the summer, I spent a fair amount of time recruiting Bible study teachers and community group leaders and people who could teach at Woodman U and kind of filled in some of the holes we had on the weekend. And then, of course, you remember two weeks ago, we had our special children's time where Josh commented on it and I commented on it. We had a children's choir. We had children in the service, and we had a table out back because we want people to serve children. And then, of course, last weekend was launch weekend for us, where we had our volunteers and our service-minded individuals who are serving as ministry partners together for some recruitment and some training. In fact, 1,200 of them showed up at our Rock Women campus so that Josh could explain what's ahead and how we needed them to help. It was a very, very exciting time. You remember the end of July, we did a service activity. We focused on the town of Monument. And you're going to be hearing all about CityServe in these next few weeks as we now take it from Monument and we do a large service campaign for the greater Colorado Springs area. Now, I mention all this because whether it's launch time or throughout the year, you're always hearing about service opportunities. So I just thought it would be appropriate to give us a basic biblical understanding of what that's about. So why are we studying it? The first reason, it seems like an appropriate time to mention a biblical perspective of service. A second reason is, if you go through the Word of God, you will see that service is a very significant theme in God's Word. In fact, except possibly for the poetic books of the Old Testament, books like Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastic and Song of Solomon, and maybe in the New Testament Revelation, you will see page after page and passage after passage will contain someone's name who is either serving God in the Old Testament or serving the gospel cause in the New Testament. In fact, if you want, you can play Bible bingo. You know what Bible bingo is? You kind of hold your Bible out and you close your eyes. And then you take your hand and you drop it in a passage of Scripture. And then you open again. And you drop it again. And if you do that, you will be amazed to see almost on either side of that page, there is somebody who was serving God in some capacity to carry out his will. In fact, I beta tested it. I did it 50 times. 42 times there was somebody who was serving God. So it does seem to be a major concept and concept that so much is based on in the Word of God. And third, I started to think through the Trinity. And of course, the Trinity is an almighty concept that's hard to wrap your head around. However, one thing you can be sure of, the model of the Trinity is service. I'm studying the Pentateuch. Fascinating study, okay? But as you study it, you will see over and over again how God served the nation of Israel. Even when they failed them, he picked them up and he served them again. You can look in the New Testament. Do you know how Jesus Christ defines himself 
It's his own self-definition. It's in Mark 10, 45. I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then the Holy Spirit. Well, you know the Holy Spirit. He convicts. He comforts. He inspired the Word of God. He brings back passages in our mind. But you'll also note that he is the author and facilitator of the spiritual gifts. And as we'll see later, spiritual gifts are a great avenue for you to use to serve. So whether it's the time of year, whether it's commenting on a major theme in the Bible, or understanding that we're following the model of the Trinity, I thought it would be interesting and helpful to talk about a biblical perspective of service. So now the question becomes, how do we approach this subject? Well, because service is so prevalent, there are so many ways you can approach it in the New Testament. However, the way that I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce something that many of you have very unfond memories of, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's basically the concept that we will look at a case study of servants throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament. Why? Because they're serving in the Bible. And because we can actually see what service is. And then from each one of those case studies, I'm going to pull out a best practice. It's very, very obvious. You know what a best practice is. A best practice is an idea. It's a phrase that describes a key ingredient in any topic under study that will produce the best results. So we're going to take this approach, which I'll mention in a moment, and we're going to look at a case study, and then we're going to pull out a best practice, and guess what? It just so happens that there's a passage in the New Testament that does exactly that. It gives us four individuals, it gives us four case studies, and four best principles. In fact, really, if you want to study service, it's one of the most concise, complete explanations of service in the entire New Testament. So that's the way we're going to do it. Well, let's just start, if we're going to do that and talk about service to the king, service to God and Jesus Christ, let's take a minute to ask his blessing on our time together. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. It is our privilege and our gift to serve you. And my prayer today is that we would just understand a little bit better what the real basic practices and what the concept of serving looks like as we do it in our lives. And Father, we'll thank you for it, and we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, let's start with our first case study. And our first case study is, of course, Jesus Christ. And the best practice is this. Before you actually do an act of service, make sure your attitude and my attitude is right. And you know what the attitude is? The attitude that Paul explains here in the example of Jesus Christ is the concept of serving with the mind of Christ. That's going to be the best practice. I think everybody would agree that when it comes to service, attitude is everything. I mean, when you're at a restaurant and you have a wait person, or maybe in a store when you have a person serving you there, or the irony is when you're talking to a customer service representative about a problem, I think we all would agree that attitude is set right at the beginning of service. And in light of that, we need to understand what that attitude should be as we represent Christ in our service. If attitude's so important, we have to set it up correctly. And the case study of Jesus Christ illustrates that in Christian service, yes, it's the act, but it's really the attitude that you go into. And that attitude is the mind of Christ. And it's not so much what we do in Christian service, but why we do it. Why do we do it? To serve God using the mind of Christ to form our attitude. Let's read the scripture. Philippians 2, verses 1 to 5. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So it's fairly obvious, right? Our attitude should be that of the mind of Christ. Well, if that's the case... What are some of the elements in the mind of Christ? And again, very concisely, Paul gives us that through the example of Christ. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm going to introduce a technique to study this particular passage here and this uh, case study that probably you have very poor memories of. We're going to diagram a sentence. Do you remember diagramming sentences? It's when the teacher would give you a topic and then a paragraph, in this case, several verses, and you'd have to go through and you'd have to underline the verse and then you'd have to underline the main word and then the second word that relates to the first word and then go down to the third word that relates to the second and the first word and then go down to the final word which summarized all of it, okay? And when you were done, it looked like a mad professor had done it, okay? This is just one of John 3.16, Look what he did to John 3.16. I just thought it was about Jesus coming to save us. But really, when you diagram something, you really understand it. So we're going to diagram what it means to have the attitude of service of Christ. Okay? Well, let's begin with the first thing that represents the mind of Christ as we form this attitude. And it's the word kenosis. Let me spell it for you. K-I-N-O-S-I-S. Now listen for that word as I read what Paul says about it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Have this mind in you among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But here it is. But emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Now, the first thing you might say is, that's great. You told me to look for that word, and it wasn't there. I know. It was a slight trick to get your interest. Do you know why it's not there? Because the entire verse captures this thing called the kenosis of Christ, which theologians say is one of the gems of the New Testament because it captures the essence of how Christ served. His first mindset was that literally kenosis is the process where Christ, in his wisdom and in his desire to serve us, basically abandoned his divine form and took on the form of a servant so that he could serve us and pour his life into us. That's kenosis. It's God himself denying himself that form so he could have empathy with us. First step in the attitude of Christ, having the mind of Christ, is what? What is it that's stopping you and stopping me from doing and serving others? In other words, what do we need to empty ourselves of, as the Bible says? Is it a prejudice you need to empty yourself of? Is it, a, is it a bad experience that is tainting all of the rest of your service? I don't know what it is, but have a little kenosis moment, okay? Be able to empty yourself of whatever that is. I need to empty myself of what it is. You need to empty yourself. That's the first step in developing the mind of Christ to serve. Well, that's the first step. What's the second It's really the basic. The second step is the idea of humility. Let me read you the verse. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. You see, you really can't humble yourself until you have this kenosis experience as God did. Until you empty yourself of your prejudice and those things that would keep you from serving. And then and only then can you be humble. So we have kenosis. And then we have humility. And humility, I looked it up in the concordance, 73 verses in the Bible of being humble, and most of them referred to the attitude of service. 
So after I emptied myself of what's stopping me from being the servant God wants me, I humble myself before him and before the person I'm serving. Well, what's the third one in this mind of Christ? The third one is the term obedience. We develop the mind of Christ through obedience. There are so many motivations to service, aren't there? So many. But I'm telling you, at the root of it, it's we're simply obeying what God wants us to do. And in tough service situations, you know what's going to get you through? What gets you through is obedient. I don't want to do it. I don't like you. I don't feel like I can do it. But I'm going to do it anyway. Why? Because God told me to be obedient. Kenosis, empty myself. Humble, obedient. Now, humble and obedient have an interesting partnership. If you're having a hard time being humble, try a dose of obedience. If you're having a hard time being obedient, try humbling yourself so that you can do what God wants you to do. But however you do it, empty yourself of whatever it is, humble yourself, be obedient. And here's the question. Why do we do all those things? The last factor in the mind of Christ tells us, and it has everything to do with the word name, N-A-M-E. Why do we do those things? So that we can introduce someone to the name of Jesus so that they might come to the Lord. Isn't that what Jesus did? His, his calling card for service, whether it was an individual or a message he was giving or a crowd he was healing, you will see the word compassion. Why? Because he wanted to use service as a conduit to bring people into the gospel. Paul can't say it any clearer than this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. Therefore, remember that, right? When you see the therefore, it's about to tell you what all the stuff before it is there for, okay? Therefore, all these things, kenosis, humble, obedience, the diagram of all this, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every knee should bow in heaven and earth. And confess, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why do we do all that? Why do we diagram the sentence? For one reason, to lead people to the name of Jesus. That's the mindset of Christ, and that's the attitude we need to have going into it. All right, I got that. I better start with the right attitude, and that better be the mind of Christ. Check. What's the next case study? The next one is of the Apostle Paul. And the practice that he's talking about is the value of sacrifice. Attitude, Christ, sacrifice, Paul. And it's found in one little verse, chapter 2, verse 17, with a powerful illustration about how important sacrifice is in service. Now, I think we'd all agree that in service, sacrifice is often there. I think the currency of sacrifice is maybe time, maybe talent, maybe money, maybe your emotional stress, maybe physical stress, whatever, there is sacrifice in service. I've heard it said that service isn't services, there's no sacrifice. I'm not sure about that, but I am sure that sacrifice is part of service. And I see it because Paul says it. Look at what it says. One verse, chapter 2, verse 17. Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. So, here's Paul. He's trying to figure out how he can explain how significant sacrifice is in service. It's one of the best practices. He goes, I got it. I got it. I'm going to compare sacrifice in the New Testament to the altar sacrifices in the Old Testament. So think about that. Let me explain both of those in just a second. The Old Testament altars, sacrifice, hugely significant throughout the Old Testament. I think we'd all agree to that. Well, what were they for? To please God. How did they do it? They had an altar. 
and they put things on the altar. There was a burnt offering, a grain offering, a peace offering, a sin offering, a guilt offering, and on and on they went. It was so common because God was pleased when they offered that as an appeasement. But then there was something called the drink offering. If you really wanted to show God that you were serious, you poured what was called a drink offering on the altar, and that was often wine. And so if you were doing this burnt offering, and you really wanted to show God, God, I'm, I really want you to accept this sincerely, you do a drink offering. Now, the Philippian church. The Philippian church, when Paul was writing this, was going under tremendous persecution. Look at chapter 1 of Philippians. It's all about the persecution of the Philippian church. Meanwhile, Paul's in jail. He's in prison. And he knows down the road he's going to be martyred for his faith. Now, put the two together. Don't miss this. This is huge. What Paul is saying is that, Philippians, your sacrifice of service on the altar... And Paul's sacrifice in jail. God appreciates them just as much and gives them as much significance as all the Old Testament sacrifices. Do you know how significant that is? He could not pick to the Jews of the day a more dramatic illustration of the significance of sacrifice in service. So, what's the second best practice? Sacrifice to God. It's as sweet a savor and offering as all the Old Testament offerings on the altar. That's significant. Well, what's the third case study? Third case study comes from Timothy. He's the main example. And the best practice is genuineness. To be genuine. Text is Philippians 2, verses 19 to 21. Now, personal opinion, okay? Out of all four of these case studies, so far we've got, right? Attitude, mind of Christ, sacrifice, and now we're on being genuine. I think genuineness has to be in the top two. Why? Because you know as well as I, if somebody's serving you and they're not genuine, then it's no service at all. If somebody is serving you selfishly, if somebody is serving you for what they can get out of it, if somebody is serving you because somebody made them do it, that's not service because it's not genuine. And Paul makes this so clear. It's not so much what you do. It's how you do it. Listen to what he says. He's pretty clear about it. Verses 19 to 21. I hope, remember he's using Timothy, that's the case study, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by the news of you, for I have no one like him, oh my, who be, here it is, who will be genuinely concerned with your welfare, for they all seek their own interests and not the interests of Jesus Christ. Now frankly, as a student of the word, that surprised me. That he would pick that particular trait to compliment Timothy on. After all, do you know what Timothy did? Man, him and Titus, they were the man, okay? I mean, Paul laid down all the stuff about the church. Here's the deacon, elders, bishop, pastors. Here's the role. Here's the governance. Timothy's the one who went out and did it. I can't imagine the administrative skills he had. I can't imagine the organizational skills he had. I can't imagine how God blessed his formation of the early church. However, Paul doesn't mention any of that. What does he mention about Timothy? In service, Timothy is the most genuine guy I have ever seen. That's amazing. Out of all he did, Paul points to his genuineness. So it must be pretty important in service. Because it's so important in service, I think we need to remember, or let me give you a couple of tips for myself and for you, on really how to display genuineness in service. Paul makes such a big deal of it. Two phrases. The first is this, share your gifts. What I mean by that is one of the most natural ways to be genuine is simply through the conduit of your spiritual gift. Think about that for a second. 
I mean, your spiritual gift is a customized gift from God. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is specifically designed to be used by service. And it is your gift of genuine service. I'm operating in what God gave me to operate in. For example, if your gift is hospitality, then it is very natural for you to be hospitable. When you are naturally hospitable, people know you're genuine. If your gift is of mercy, then you are naturally merciful to people. And when people see you being naturally merciful, they know you're genuine. If your gift is helps, then it's very natural for you to plug in and help people. And when you do that, you're just naturally sharing who you are, and it comes across very genuinely. Now, don't misunderstand me. Let me give a disclaimer. I am not saying that the only way you can serve genuinely is through your gift. You can serve through any gift, through any way. I am saying if you want a primer course on it, and it's difficult for you to be genuine in your service, try serving through your gift. You got God's power and the Holy Spirit behind you. That's the first tip. The second one is this. Not only share your gift, but basically, I want you to think about the fact that you need to show your tell. Now, you know what a tell is? A tell is a fabricated word that describes what I refer to as your natural default to genuineness. In other words, it may be your gestures. It may be your action. It may be the, what people call your natural bent. It may be the expression of your personality. It may be that everybody knows this about you. Whatever your tell is, it is your genuine, genuineness trait. I mean, the disciples all had a tell. <laughs> they did. And they served people through it. I mean, John. John was the beloved disciple, the best friend of Jesus, wrote the gospel about his best friend, saying to everybody, my best friend is God. You know, I mean, it was like they were close. He was a very emotive guy, very kind, very caring. I can just see him when Jesus was discouraged a couple of times in the scripture. John putting his arm around him saying, Jesus, don't worry, I'm with you. And Jesus sensed the genuineness of John. He was the beloved disciple. Now, Peter, his tell <laughs> was very different than John's, okay? Peter was one of those guys who said something before he thought about it and said it like it was absolute gospel truth. And you know what? I don't get it, but it served Peter very well, didn't it? Because, man, that guy went out and got it, and I can just see Jesus going over to Peter. Peter, great point, but your delivery stinks. You know, I, but that was his tell, and you can see how successful he was. What about Matthew? Matthew, you know, was a tax collector, so he was organized. He was a good administrator. He knew how to write things down. He knew how to keep records, and I can just see Jesus going up to him and saying, hey, Matthew, you can serve me. I'm, see that mountain? I'm about to go on top of that mountain, and I'm going to say some really cool stuff. Would you mind writing it down in a user-friendly way? Thus, we have the Sermon on the Mount. What was Paul's tell? <laughs> he was somewhat of a know-it-all in the sense that he knew a lot. He really was. And he used it. Look at the brilliance of Paul's epistles. That's the way he served us. You know, the disciples were serving the same time that Paul was. And I can just see them getting together and saying, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? You know, because that was who Paul was. I'd even suggest that Jesus had a tell. I mentioned it earlier. Jesus had compassion. You will either see his compassion or Christ will actually, the gospel writers will say, and looking on the crowd, Jesus had compassion on them. Or looking at the woman, or looking at the blind man, or looking at the lame, he had compassion. It was his tell, and he led him to service. So what's your tell? Use it for service. Now, I thought long and hard about this before I'm going to say it to you. But I figure if I'm saying to you, wow, share your gift and tell your tell, okay? Let me tell you what some of my tells of service are. And I'm not saying this in a boastful way, nor am I saying it to confirm your belief that I'm really lame. I am just saying this as an example of what I'm talking about. My first tell is that I smile a lot. If I see you, I will smile at you. 
If not, you're in trouble. But I will smile at you, okay? Because I believe a smile is worth a thousand words. I believe a smile is the first sentence of a connection of genuineness with somebody. Now, I'm not saying that everybody needs to smile. I know some of you. I know you can't smile. I understand that. But some of you love to hug. I'm from Jersey. We do not hug in Jersey. We receive hugs if it's necessary, but we don't give hugs, okay? But if you're a hugger, go to it. Frown yourself as long as you're hugging. Or maybe if you are, have this intuitive nature about you, you can just walk up to somebody and you can just kind of tell them the way, you're nervous, aren't you? You can just tell them the way that you feel. That's a beautiful tell. My wife has that tell. It drives me crazy because she always knows what I'm feeling. She doesn't have to hug me. She doesn't have to smile. She just says, Doug, here's your problem. Here's what you do about it. You know, I don't care what your tell is. It doesn't have to be a smile, a hug, intuition. Whatever it is, use it. My second tell is that I'll look you in the eye. Hi, Matt. We really appreciate that 462 cadets you brought with you today. All right? And I'll look you in the eye and I'll thank you. Why? Don't you believe someone is genuine when they look you in the eye? It's like something that is just connects you there. In fact, I got to the point where if I see you over there, don't hold me to this because I mess up on all these things, but I try. And we make eye contact. Rick, I didn't see. There's 15 people between us. I will weave between them to say hi to Rick. Why? Because I figure if Rick sees that I saw him and he saw me and I didn't come over, I'm not being very pastoral, okay? Again, you don't have to make eye contact and walk to somebody. But what are you doing to express your genuineness? Here's the big one. This is one that I do, and I really try to do this. I mess up at times. You ought to do it too because it's the biggest. I don't care if you smile, I don't care if you make eye contact, but do this. It's a great tell. When you tell somebody you're going to do something, follow through. It's unbelievable. I can't believe how many times when I'll follow through on something someone asked me, they'll say to me, oh, wow, you did that. And I'm thinking, yeah, you asked me to. It's a surprise to people when you follow through on what you tell them. That says something to me about genuineness. Or pray for them. If someone tells you to pray for them, write it down. Do something. Make a mental note and then go back to them. This is, always kills me. Hey, how's that going, Travis? I was praying for you this week. You were praying for me? Well, thank you. Well, didn't you ask me to pray? You see what I mean? All that to say, what's the best practice of Timothy? It's not attitude, oh, that's important in Jesus Christ, have the mind of Christ. It's not so much sacrifice, oh, Paul's, <laughs> Paul's committing that and comparing it to an Old Testament sacrifice. Just be genuine. It goes a long way in Christian service. And then finally, the last one, Epaphroditus, a very interesting one. The case study is by this guy, Epaphroditus. We don't know much about him. And his case study is being selfless. Being selfless. It's not attitude. It's not sacrifice. It's not genuineness. It's selflessness. Now, I'd love to read the story, but it's rather long. So let me give you the uh, executive summary of it. Paul's in jail, right? Now, he knows he'll probably be martyred. It's not easy. He's chained to the Praetorian Guard. But you know what? He's a Roman citizen, so he can be in house arrest, and he can have a guest. So can't you see the meeting back in Philippi? Hey, everybody, come on, gather. We're going to gather Tuesday afternoon and talk about Paul. Hey, you all know Paul. Good man. He's done a lot for us. He's in jail in Rome. I know, I know Rome is very hostile to us, and Caesar's going to see him. I know that Caesar could kill you and put you on a pole in a minute, and he's chained to a Praetorian guard who's probably a spy and will say everything to you, to the hierarchies, and you might get killed for this, but who wants to go help Paul, Right? <laughs> This guy, by the name of Epaphroditus, we'll call him Mr. E. Mr. E throws up his hand. Ooh, I will, I will. So he does. He goes to serve Paul <laughs> selflessly. He gets there, and guess what? He gets sick as a dog. He can't do any selfless service. So Paul takes care of him, but Paul's so impressed with his 
selfless attitude, he writes a letter back at the end of this letter and he says, man, treat this guy like a hero. Now, it's weird, isn't it? We don't know anything about him. And here's an opinion I have about that. Maybe, just maybe, Paul chose somebody to write about who we know nothing about because that's what selfish is, is all about. We don't care about the person doing the serving. We just care about who he serves. That's just my little insight. I threw it in for nothing, okay? But Epaphroditus does teach us some stuff about selflessness. First, from a motivational point, selflessness is self-appointed. No one can tell you to be selfish, selfless, unless you are. He raised his hand. I will do it. Motivated from the heart. Selflessness is self-appointed. Second one is, remember, selflessness has no expectation of return. The ROI is zero, okay? And it's true. He failed. He had a selfless attitude. He went. There was no return on his service. He got sick. Paul had to take care of him. But Paul sends him back with this glowing report. Please, please welcome him back with open arms. He's such a selfless man. Isn't that interesting? And then finally, he teaches us about relationship. Selflessness put relationships before results. The most important thing was not what he did, but that he selflessly went. And that is the story of Mr. E. I'll throw in a bonus here. Paul also showed selflessness. The last thing Paul needed as he's writing these prison epistles and probably being hassled by all the guards is to take care of this guy. But he does it selflessly. So apparently, selflessness has a lot to do with biblical service. There you have it. A, a, a sort of executive summary, if you would. One chapter that gives us four individuals with four case studies and four best practices. What do we take from it? First, it all starts with the attitude, the right attitude. Have the mind of Christ. Get your pencil out. Do the diagram, kenosis, empty myself of what would keep me from serving. And then I can be humble. And when I get humble, I can obey and do what God wants me to do. And you know why I'm doing it? I'm doing it for his name. <laughs> Secondly, try after the attitude, what Paul is teaching us, to, to really show a sacrificial aspect of service. It's as important to God as, as altars in the Old Testament. Third, be genuine. Of all the things Paul could have said about Timothy, he's boasting on his genuineness. Share your gifts, show your tells. And finally, selflessness. From a guy we hardly know, from the longest passage in that whole Philippians 2, there must be something to selflessness. Now we know it, but the question always, always with service is now, what are we going to do about it? I think I'll leave that to you and God. Let's pray. Well, Father, if we didn't know what service was, we know what it is now. Check that off the list. And Father, now that we have the head knowledge, if you would, about attitude and sacrifice and genuineness and selflessness, we got to add the heart. And so, Father, we just pray, however you want to move in each one of our individual hearts, would you do that? Move us to the realization that service, as Paul explained, leads people to the name of Jesus so that they can be saved. Shows people the model of the Trinity and how they served. And, Lord, is a way to totally expand and explain the gospel without words, but in action. We pray this for myself. We pray this for everyone here. And we ask it in your name. Amen.